what kind of life is this? Check, check, one, two, is that right? Check, one, two. All right, well, this is kind of exciting. Um, I'm in a new place, new location, new home, new studio, uh, new everything. So this is gonna be the new, uh, this will be my YouTube studio in here, so stay tuned as it evolves. This is just uh, basic, I just threw the camera up, uh, and um, hooked up the microphone and, and popped the light on my corner, and uh, we're gonna start talking. Guys and gals, it's been a while, and a lot has gone on in my life, um, more than I am, <laughs> can even tell you. A lot of good things, some bad things, you know, some horrendous things, and some um, immense blessings. Um, I want to start off by telling you that today marks... July, August, September, October, November? What's today's date? I don't know what today's date. November? Five. So now we are almost 18 months since my spinal fusion, okay? My spinal fusion was last June, not this past June, the previous June. So June plus five months or whatever. And um, boy, I have learned a lot, guys and gals. I have learned a lot about myself. So I don't even know where to begin. But what I'm going to tell you is that this has been a rough road. I'm going to be straight up with you right off the bat. Spinal fusion is no joke. And I just made a short the other day um, saying like spinal fusion should be your last option or uh, last resort or something like that. But I want to hit that home. I want to tell you guys, uh, spinal fusion, getting cut open should be your last resort. It should be the last thing you think about. You should change everything about your lifestyle that you possibly can before entertaining surgery, before having them operate on your spine and those nerves because you're done. Once you're open, you're done. There's so much that can be done before resorting to a spinal fusion. Uh, change your lifestyle, change your, your, your job if you have to, change your occupation, change your hobbies, change your, your dietary habits, change your exercise, uh, change the way you live your life, change your bed. I mean, one of the best decisions I ever made was to get the high-end Tempur-Pedic a few years ago, and that thing has been amazing, even before my fusion, uh, during my fusion, and now, I still love getting in that bed. Um, it was the best Tempur-Pedic that I could find, and it's a king, and it's huge, and I made payments on it, and I own it now, and it's amazing, guys. So, make changes to your lifestyle that incrementally, or slowly, or, or just whatever, do whatever you can do to avoid surgery until surgery is just it's your last option. And I did that. Okay. I did that. But now, okay. Now that I've said that now, here's the contrary to that. Continuing to prolong, um, pain and prolong, um, suffering and damage increases what that surgery will have to then take care of. Does that make sense? So for me, my initial injury was 18 years ago. I blew out my L5-S1 in one shot. Like, I mean, that sucker it was halfway out in one shot. I was deadlifting. And I had been deadlifting heavy for years, doing great. My back was looking great. I felt strong. But just one day, one day, I was warming up with 115 pounds. And I just tweaked a little bit to the side. And that was it. That was it. It blew out L5-S1. Now, there are some theories as to why, for me, I had a spinal tap um, a few years before that, and one of my doctors said that that spinal tap could have weakened that area of my back, and that's what did it for me, which I believe that fully, yeah, because uh, going in for a spinal tap, they didn't get the spinal fluid at all. The, the doctor, whoever's going in, the anesthesia and whatever, anesthetic, statistician, that person with the needle, the person with the needle, stuck that big long needle into my back over and over and over because they couldn't get the fluid. The guy's like, oh, you're not drawing fluid. That thing hurt like a mother effer. And I think they, tr they made five attempts to get the spinal fluid but couldn't get it. So that very well could have weakened my L5-S1 area, resulting in blowing my disc a, a few years later. But then I, I continued to uh, work construction and set tile and play, my, play guitar and do crazy things with my guitar and climb trees as an arborist and 
uh, wrestle and box and fight and train hard and, and lift weights and bodybuild. And I just continue to live, <laughs> you know, um, that lifestyle and mask my pain with a lot of ibuprofen and caffeine in the beginning. I mean, I was on, um, 1200 milligrams of ibuprofen three times a day for years, years. And that fortunately for me, the one good thing is that I always took it with food always throughout my whole life. I've always taken ibuprofen with food. So I never had any stomach or, or liver issues with that. Um, but I did, use a lot of it. I'd be pro from for years. And then obviously I'm losing energy and losing stamina and I'm taking more caffeine and what a downward spiral that was to, you know, a year and a half ago needing a spinal fusion. And I got to tell you guys, there are times that I think to myself, did I make the right choice? Now for me, I, I did make the right choice. I had to, I, I mean, I finally got to the point where I needed surgery because my vertebrae, because let's say in between here is a disc, right? That's your disc. My vertebrae were bone on bone. That disc blew out and was in little pieces, particles all over my back, inside, right? Pushing on nerves all over the place. Then I had bone on bone and this vertebrae just always rubbed like this. Can you imagine climbing trees? I was like opening the vertebrae, closing, opening, closing, lifting weights, opening, closing. And slowly the vertebrae just started chipping off each other. And I ended up having pieces of bone chips in between my vertebrae and they were grinding and I could feel this constant pain. It was terrible. It was horrible. It was a horrible pain. And I'm not a, oh, I'm not a, I'm not a pansy to pain, man. I can take a lot of pain and it was a terrible pain all the time with no relief. All I did was have to, I masked it. And then eight years ago, I started taking Kratom, you know, Kratom. Yes, I know. I call it Kratom. And eight years ago, I found Kratom, and that really helped greatly. But everything I could do, opioids, you know, uh, Kratom, ibuprofen, Tylenol, anti-inflammatories, all it did was mask the pain for me so that I could continue to live and work and provide for my family and play with my kids and give my kids a good life. And that's all it was about for me. Was, it was all about my kids. Even all my companies. Uh, I started each of the companies for my kids to take over so that they had something um, that I could give to them that could provide for their families. But I started losing function on my right leg and my right leg started going numb all the time. And actually I started collapsing on the job site a couple times. My, uh, the, you know, I've fallen and I can't get up type of thing. And I'm yelling for my, my, uh, workers, uh, to come get me. And, you know, those of you who are OGs have been around for a long time. You guys know chatter, uh, MC chatter, uh, had to come pick me up and, and take me to uh, the hospital a few times. So it got really bad to the point where I just couldn't function anymore and I couldn't live in that pain. And it was like there, I had no life anyway. So what was the point? So I, I started looking for a surgeon and it did take me a few years to find the right surgeon, but the damage was already done. And my right leg has really degenerated and suffered. And I'm in a lot of constant pain still that back pain from the discs, uh, from the, from the vertebrae rubbing on chips of bone, that back pain is relieved, but I still do have lower back pain that radiates off to the sides of my back. And my right leg is much worse, much worse. And a recent MRI that I just had done a couple months ago shows that I have scar tissue building and pushing on my sciatic nerve of my right leg. And that scar tissue is pretty substantial apparently, but it's always rubbing or pushing against my sciatic nerve. So my leg is always numb and tingly. And that has been really hard to live with because I also have a brain injury. Um, eight years ago, I was hit by the back end of one of my Mason body dump trucks and it uh, cracked my skull here and bruised my brain. So I have a pretty bad TBI. And how that affects me is it, it my impact was right over my pituitary gland here. And uh, if you don't know, the pituitary gland, through the signaling of the hypothalamus in the brain, 
tells the body to produce, maintain, and function your hormones. And so my pituitary gland got rocked pretty badly. So I had to go on TRT, which is testosterone replacement therapy. So that's exogenous testosterone because my body wasn't producing it properly. Now here we are almost a year and a half later and I want to say to you, what kind of life is this? You know, I want to be completely real with you guys. There are many days that I can't get out of bed because my leg is just dead. It, it just feels, I don't know how else to say it to you. It just, my leg feels dead and it's exhausting is the problem. It, it's, it's exhausting on my entire body and I don't know how much of it is also my pituitary gland um, but there are some other issues at, at play with this okay the longer you're on opioids or, or um, pain meds and kratom the more saturated your receptors in your body become the less or the, the more the more desensitized they become so obviously the less it works so the more you need to take then obviously your dopamine signaling is just dead you have no exogenous dopamine signaling okay meaning inside your body you're not getting that kick of excitement or anticipation anymore on your own it has to be artificially produced in order for you to feel it so it, it, sometimes you'll be like oh i get to take my pain meds in an hour or, oh, I get to take my Kratom in an hour. And that anticipation is a signaling of the dopamine that goes throughout our body that gets us excited artificially. That's not good. <laughs> That's not good. So I've been taking Kratom for eight years and I can't get going or motivated without Kratom or without pain pills in my body or without gabapentin going on in my body because... I don't know if it's just the lack of energy from the surgery or if it's the pain or if it's the desensitization of my dopamine. Um, I don't know. Or it's probably all of them. It's probably a, a combination of everything. But then you say to yourself, I'm in bed half the day every day. What kind of a life is this? Well, the problem is, is I was in bed half the day before surgery. And then I had surgery. And now I'm in bed half the day now. And my legs suck. Driving is tough. If I'm driving for more than a half an hour, I lose feeling in my legs. I have to stop, get out, and walk around a little bit and get feeling back to my feet. It fortunately doesn't affect my driving because it's a very clear, it's in, it's in very clear increments. Meaning it doesn't all happen at once. It never has. It's just slowly I lose feeling. Slowly I get numb and slowly I get pains and tingling. It, it, you know, what do you call it? Tingles, tingles. Slowly it starts to tingle more. Tingle more. Um, and then I know what's coming next. So I can, I can preemptively act. Um, but but like for instance, four months after my spinal fusion, I'm still laying in my chair every day doing my walks and some exercising and some resistance band work, as you've seen in my other videos. And my wife of 16 years um, got up and left and took my three youngest kids from me and just left me and my older boys, just left us. Said she was going to the library and going to get lunch and left. And I won't go into that any further. Um, hopefully you guys know me by now. I think that I come across in a very genuine way and I hope that you do know enough about me that you know how I respect women and how I treat others. Let's just say that because I don't want to go too deep into the thought process of that because I haven't seen my little, my babies. I have six kids and my three youngest were taken from me by her. And so I haven't seen them in almost a year. And I'm fighting for custody of them. And I have custody of my two older boys. And I will keep that custody. Because they are amazing. And that's what they need. Encouragement, support, and love. And well, I don't want I don't want to I don't want this I don't want this video to be about that, but I've learned a lot, let's say, about other people, about myself. Um, the incredible thing. 
the incredible thing is that I have been blessed to meet someone who has changed my life. In so many ways. But has shown me love and compassion and support and care and empathy and encouragement. And just the way that people operate on their internal systems is so vastly different that I want each of you to know and understand that I know there's hardships, okay? There's always going to be hardships, but you can tell a lot by the way a person treats you on a normal day, day day-to-day basis, and then when things get tough. Pay attention because you'll see the signs. You'll see the red flags. And those red flags really need to tell you what to do. Stay or run. Okay? And sometimes you do need to run. (sighs) My sons are now 15 and almost 13, and they are just the most amazing young men. And they don't let me, like, if I drop something in the kitchen, which, by the way, most of you probably understand this, I drop things all day long. I drop everything. I shake all the time. The nerve damage is extensive. Um, I'll drop something. And it's almost like like a dog comes running. Like I drop something in the kitchen and it's boom. And one of my sons comes running in. Don't touch it, dad. I got it. And it's literally like a game to see which one of them can pick it up before I do. And it's just, that's the kind of, you know, young men that they are. And I'm so proud of them in in, in so many ways. But they have gotten me through this. But so my point is, is that four months after my spinal fusion, my now ex-wife left, left us. And many of you know that I was restoring an an 1880s Victorian manor, okay, that was originally eight bedrooms. So you can imagine how vast this house was. It was gorgeous. It was my dream. I bought it as a foreclosure and I put everything into it. My blood, sweat, tears, and every dollar into that home. And my kids and I loved it. I would have died there. And I think that it would have just continued in the family because that's how much my kids and I loved that house. But it was fully furnished and she left us fully furnished. And my two sons and I, with the help of a couple people from our church, um, had to empty that entire house. And although I tried to be smart about how I moved and how I operated, I still had to do things I wasn't supposed to. I still had to go against doctor's orders for my recovery. I was supposed to be able to recover properly for a year. And within four or five months, I'm packing, moving, uh, lifting, bending, twisting. I'm doing all the things that I'm not supposed to do. And so I know, unfortunately, I know because after we moved, I was in basically in bed for a month after we moved because of all the pain, the suffering, the additional um, strain on my surgery and I know that I'm suffering for that now and I will probably suffer for that uh, permanently so sadly enough I was not given the chance to recover properly fully for the period of time that my surgeon told us I would need to a year this is a year-long recovery and you need that I didn't get that I didn't get that at all and it is what it is I'm not gonna cry your river but Then we had to move, and now we recently moved again, and uh, we're in a wonderful, beautiful home. Uh, It's it's just down the road from the 1880s Victorian. You know, it's just down the road. Almost seems like the the same builder. It's gorgeous. I'd love to give you guys a tour at some point, but it's another old, like uh, late 1800s farmhouse, and we're on three acres here, and it's it's the property that I've been renting my barn and offices from for six years. So it's completely familiar to us, and we love it. We love it here. Um, Work. Let's talk about that. Many of you know I have owned many companies. I've started many companies. Uh, The Train Landscape Service, Chip Chop and Grind, the construction company, Build, Guild, and Refine, the furniture company, Rosewood and Ironworks, and then I had the channel, The New Woodworker, which now became Healing Together. And I also had a production company called Rock and World Productions. Okay. So I did all these, all these companies for my kids. I started them and I worked them and I chip chop and grind was award winning. 
um, for all, we won Angie's List awards. We won lots of local awards. Build, Guild, and Refine was um, published in a uh, local publication. But the point is, is that they were successful, and we worked very hard to build those companies. I can't work them. I can't work them. It's hard enough getting out of bed each day. And that is one of the worst things for me to experience because I love to work. It's, 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 it's terrible. I love working labor. I love digging a ditch. I love swinging a sledgehammer. I love climbing trees. I love running a chainsaw. And anyone who knows me knows that that's what I've, I've always done. But at the same time, I've been in the music industry as a performing artist, producer, engineer, as an actor, as a model, and as a trainer and coach for bodybuilders. So I am very passionate about a few things, okay? One of my greatest passions is coaching. I love coaching. I love building someone up to a new version of themselves. I love helping people achieve their goals. So I am back to bodybuilding. I am back to coaching, and which is really hard because I can't stay on my feet for very long. So I love coaching, but... I met uh, this amazing woman who has changed my life now because of coaching. And, you know, we've been together now for a, a while and she's just a beautiful person in every way. But she had, uh, she had done a bodybuilding competition 20 years ago and she won first place. And she was a champ and she's amazing. And she asked me to coach her. Uh, actually, she asked me to coach both she and her 17-year-old daughter, who would be turning 18 on the day of the competition. And they both won first place. We got first place wins across the board in their categories. And I couldn't be more proud of both of them. Because both she and her daughter are amazing people with the biggest hearts and the most dedication to, to their devotion and what they're doing. And my boys, my boy uh, Lucius is 15 and Darius is now almost 13 this month. They got to be a part of that. Uh, I'll put up a picture here. You'll see us on the day of, of the championship. We won on the day of the competition and all of our uh, awards, all of our first place trophies, and uh, my boys got to be a part of that. And so I started Hard Gains with a Z as my coaching platform. And I started that also for my boys to be a part of. You know, my 15-year-old my Lucius is now bodybuilding and he has, made, <laughs> he has made incredible progress. I am so proud of him because he's working hard. He's eating hard. And he's just doing it the right way. And he's listening to what I say. He's listening. To, that's probably the one area in life that he really, really listens to what I say uh, the most. I mean, he's a good kid. He listens to me. But... And now my soon-to-be 13-year-old Darius, he's so busy teaching himself backflips and, um, you know, riding wheelies like crazy. Like, and he's got a YouTube channel and an Instagram page on this stuff. And now he wants to bodybuild. Okay, so he's now started. And he's already, you know, developing good muscle. Um, so this is something that we love to do together. You know, we go to the gym and we train every day. Me, my two boys, my girlfriend, and a lot of the times her daughter. Um, and it's, you know, <laughs> um, they call us the, 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 the built family. Uh, and, um, it's, it's pretty amazing. But now throughout this entire process and this entire time, I'm just hurting so much inside because my kids, my three babies are away from me. And how can you possibly be happy if you're missing half your heart? And my three younger kids are the babies. They're, they're the ones that grow still and learn every day and do something different every day. And it's my youngest son who was my little shotgun rider. He went everywhere with me. Anytime I left the house, he wanted to go with me. Anytime I went to the job site, he wanted to go with me. He, uh, he wanted to, to, to coach bodybuilders like me. He wanted to work the tree service like that. He says, Daddy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work chip chop and grind like you. And my two daughters, my only two daughters, 
who are now six and four. And my heart is just shattered. And I hear a lot of people go through things like this and they, you know, they blame God or they curse God and, um, you know, guys and gals, it's not God. It's not, it's, it's just, it's life. It's, it's other people's decisions. Everyone has free agency. Everyone gets to make their own choices. Sadly enough, some people make some very, very terrible and destructive choices and they affect us. So, um, so friends, uh, this has already been a long enough video. Um, this is going to be part one. How about that? Let's do part one. But I guess ultimately the point of this video is I really want you all to ask yourself, have I tried everything else before surgery? Have I tried physical therapy? Have I tried stretching routines? Have I tried yoga and meditation? Have I tried ice and heat? Have I tried a Theragun and a foam roller? Have I tried massage therapy, chiropractic therapy? Have I tried changing my diet, taking out inflammatory foods? Have I tried um, even, uh, you know, um, cortisone shots potentially? Have I tried everything before a spinal fusion? So friends, that's what I'm going to leave you with. Have you tried everything before your fusion? Because I really urge you to do that. All right, guys and gals, it's great to see you again, you know, obviously through, through the lens. I really look forward to hearing from you all in the comments section. I love, love hearing from each of you, and I want you to know that. I don't always get a chance to respond to the comments because the channel is growing so big, uh, so exponentially, and I don't always see the comments or get the time, especially with the other channel. So, friends, I love you all, and I wish you the best. Stay tuned.